Hello, welcome back. This video is an extension of the last video, which was about Gauss's law from a conceptual perspective. Now we're going to be looking at it as a way to calculate the electric field when other methods might be too difficult or impossibly to solve analytically. So for this example, we're going to look at an infinitely charged plate. So what this means is that we have a plate that goes to infinity in two uh, axis directions. In this case, we could call it the x and the y. And so the surface of the plane would be normal to the z direction. Um, and it's important that our charge density, which would be a surface charge or area charge density in this case, that's sigma, is going to be uniform. In other words, it's a constant for every bit of area throughout the whole plane. All right, so we know that Gauss's law tells us that the, the electric flux through an enclosed surface is equal to the sum of all charges enclosed in that surface divided by the permittivity of free space. All right, so now we have to manipulate this in a way that's going to help us find the electric field strength at some distance d away from an infinitely large charge, uniformly charged plane. All right, so let's start with figuring out the flux on the left side here. All right, and I probably should have labeled these, these red vectors are E field vectors. And of course they point away from sigma because in this case, I'm saying that sigma is positively charged. Um, because this is an infinitely wide and tall um, charged plane and it's uniformly charged, the E fields come out orthogonal to the surface of the plane. So this is going to be quite useful as we kind of work our way towards finding the electric field strength at some distance D away from the plane. So let's start with the left side of the equation. So you see I've drawn this dashed uh, cylinder here. And the reason why I drew it dashed is because it's just a figment of our imagination that we're going to use to solve this problem. So typically this is called a Gaussian surface. In this case, it's cylindrical Gaussian surface. And we've picked it for a particular reason that has to do with symmetry of the system. And we'll get to that in just a second. So. The cylinder really has three surfaces that are kind of disjoint. Uh, one would be the, um, the rolled up uh, rectangle that creates the tube, right? Then there would be the two end caps, which are, are circular. And so if we're going to find the flux through this enclosed surface, we're going to have to find the flux through each of these three um, surfaces that comprise the, the cylinder. So let me go ahead and write it like this. So I'm going to say E dot DA1. See how I've got this vector labeled A1, this one A2, and this one A3. And I'll go ahead and write one down here. Um, then we have to find the flux through area two. And then lastly, we have to find the flux through the rolled up rectangular portion of the cylinder, which I'm calling A3. All right, so let's start with the easy one. So it's kind of hard to draw all of the possible area vectors for A3, because as, as you can see, they, they would be normal to that portion of the cylinder surface at every point. Um, but one thing that's in common is that all those possible representations of the A3 vector are all orthogonal to the E field vector. And that is quite useful because remember E dot DA3, right? That would be E times or times cosine theta da3, right? That's the definition of the dot product. 
And theta, of course, is the angle between that area and the E field. And in this case, it's 90 degrees. So cosine of 90 is zero. So this whole term goes to zero for that very reason. Now we're going to do the other two. So let's start with this first one right here. So because we're equidistant, so each point on this surface is distance D from the infinitely charged plate, that means that the E field is going to be the same at every point on this end cap. Reason being is because we have the uniform surface charge density. And so what that means is that I can write, I can pull out E, I can pull out the E vector because it is in fact uh, constant for every, or the strength is the same for every uh, point of that surface. Of course, I have to do the cosine of the angle between them because of the dot product. Okay, and you may notice that the A1 vector is parallel to the E vector and parallel means either zero or 180 degrees. In this case, they're pointed in the same direction. So that would be zero degrees. Cosine of zero is one. So now we have E integral of dA one. And of course the integral of one with respect to anything, right? Is just that thing. So here we have E A one. Once we're done integrating this dA one. All right, and we'll keep going. So now all we need to do is find the area of one, you know, the, the magnitude of the area. And of course, since it's uh, a disc, circular, just gonna be pi r squared. All right, so we carried that one down. And you may notice that this other end cap, A2, is distance D. So in other words, we have a symmetry there. It's the same distance away. So it would be a valid assumption to think that the E field strength would be the same over on this end cap as it is on this end cap. And because the E field lines point away from that uh, uniform charge distribution, they end up also being parallel to A2. So E is parallel to A2. And so really this ends up being the exact same as this. And so the same process will, and of course, the magnitude of A, A2 is equal to the magnitude of A1. So they're both pi r squared because this cylinder has the same radius everywhere. All right, so we have found the left-hand side of Gauss's law here for this specific case. The next step is we need to find the right-hand side. Of course, E naught's a constant, so that's not, <laughs> not a big deal. Uh, and so we just need to find the sum of all the charges enclosed in this Gaussian cylinder. And because we're looking at a flat plane, it's safe to say that all the charge that lies within the cylinder comes from this uh, area that I'm cross-hatching right now. Okay. And if we recall, um, sigma, the definition of sigma is charge per area or per surface area. And in this case, we could multiply the area on both sides and that would tell us that charge equals sigma times A times the area. And the area of this hatched region is once again, pi r squared. Okay. So, if this is us finding the charge in the hatched region, then that means that this is equal to saying this is all the charge enclosed in the hatched region. So now we can go ahead and fill out both sides of the equation down here. And what we'll end up with is for the left side, of course, we have two times E times pi R squared. And on the left side, we has equal the charge enclosed, which is equal to sigma times pi r squared divided by the permittivity of free space. And now we're to our last step where we get to solve for the E field. So we solve for the strength of the E field 
by dividing um, and algebraically rearranging. And what we'll notice is that the pi r squareds cancel. And what we're left with is that the E field strength at some distance d away from an infinitely uniformly charged plane is sigma over two times E zero. So in other words, or epsilon zero. So it's the, the charge density divided by two times the permittivity of the space, which is really interesting because you'll notice there has, there's nothing in this formula about D. So with everything else we've done in this class, the further away we get from the charge, the less the electric field strength is. But in this case, that's just not the case because D isn't in our formula. And so what that has to do with is because the plane is so expansive. Um, actually, let me make another analogy. You'll recall a few videos ago for the far field approximation of the charge disk. As we get further and further away from the disk, it appears more and more point-like. And so the electric field can be approximated as that caused by a point charge. Now, if you are dealing with an infinite plane, it doesn't matter how close you get to it or how far away you get from it, because from the perspective of scale, infinity is not a fixed number. So it just keeps going. So no matter how far or how close you get to this plane, it's going to appear the same size, infinite, which means that the electric field is going to be the same everywhere. And that's also a consequence of one of our assumptions, which is that the E field would be all orthogonal to the surface of the plane. You'll recall that when uh, I was discussing why the E field gets weaker around a point charge, it's because the electric field line density decreases, right? There's more field lines per area here than there are field lines per area here. But in the case of the infinitely charged plane, it doesn't matter how far away you get from the plane, the same amount of field lines are going through that area. So for these reasons, this is the formula for the E field caused by an infinite uniformly charged plane. And you may recognize it as the far field approximation from our um, disk, or I'm sorry, the near field approximation from the disk video. So you remember with the disk video, the closer and closer you get to the disk, we found that its electric field strength could be written as sigma over two times the permittivity of free space. And of course, it makes sense because if you get really close to the disk, well, I mean, what's the difference between being really close to a very large disk and being next to an infinitely charged plane? I mean, you really can't tell the difference when you're close. So it's interesting that we have come up with this sigma over two epsilon naught in two different ways using two different methods. And so this is just the first example that I wanted to talk about as far as using Gauss's law as a tool to find the E field. You'll notice that this nasty looking integral became very simple quickly. And that's kind of what Gauss's law is good for. It's good for finding symmetries and exploiting them in order to find the electric field in a way that is not impossible or very taxing. So I hope this video is helpful and I'll see you next video.